I really want to kind of go into three different areas. Um, I want to review the aesthetic market and talk a little bit about what's happening in the market and what the needs are for aesthetic providers. And then we will transition a little bit into talking about training and skill development. And then we will kind of go into a little bit of the compensation parameters that um, are a little bit different when you're talking about the cash medicine. And I know those of you who do cash lasers and you know hyperdiathrosis and things like that in the dermatology world, um, you know, have some familiarity with this, but for others, they may never have had the opportunity to even think about um, cash medicine in terms of treatments with this. So just want to talk about just some things to be aware of and things that might be a little bit different. So let's really just kind of dig into what's kind of happening in the aesthetic market in the United States. And it really is kind of broken into three areas. Obviously there are the energy devices and looking at what they can do for skin, for skin tightening, for hair, for age spots, things like that. There are a lot of wonderful um, medical grade skincare products that can complement a lot of what you all do in your dermatology practices. But where I focus on is looking at aesthetic injectables. And I think most people have seen over the last couple of years that the consumer demand has grown extraordinarily. And whether it be because of something like the Kardashians who are, seems like on digital media every other day, um, the rise of things like Snapchat and Instagram and TikTok and having consumers more aware of what can be done with aesthetic treatments or whether it literally is just a fallout from COVID. Um, this graph is kind of a fun one to look at because it looks at the amount of Zoom and online use before COVID and then afterwards. And you think about, we had about a year and a half of everybody sitting in front of their computers looking at themselves and then not having a whole lot of places to go or things to spend money on. And a lot of them chose to come see you or to come see other aesthetic practices and investigate aesthetic procedures. Because of that consumer demand, it has really created a need for more providers. The other thing that we've seen the last couple of years, I know you all as dermatology um, providers have seen the huge influx of private equity money and integration that has happened within the dermatology world. And you look at this chart from some of the practical dermatology information, and you see that across the United States, we're not looking at mom and pa uh, dermatology practices anymore or independent sole owner dermatology practices. We're looking at a lot of these practices that now own many, many dermatology practices in their area or across the country. I added the four syringes here to give you an idea of all of these big private equity groups that have come into the dermatology market. Only four that are on this graph really do a lot or primarily are concerned with um, cash aesthetic medicine. Um, you've got Ideal Image down there in the Florida area that still has about 80% of their business is laser hair removal and cool sculpting. Um, the Mid-Atlantic syringe there is Sona and Sona Dermatology and Med Spa took the 23 Sona locations and then they merged with Roberta Palestine's practices up in the DC area. So they now have about um, 15 practices around the country where they focus on dermatology and aesthetic medicine and kind of a full continuum of care. You have um, out on the West Coast in the San Francisco area, Skin Spirit, which is probably what I, I think of as kind of the, the role model for med spa aesthetic practices. They were started and really funded a lot of their original growth um, internally starting in about 2010 or 11 and uh, have about almost 30 practices across the country now. And then obviously down in the LA area, you have Laser Away, which still primarily focuses on more laser and energy device treatments. But the influx of um, what you've seen in dermatology with private equity and um, aggregation of the practices is now starting to happen within the aesthetic arena as well. But it's happening in a little bit different way. And so what we're seeing on the left-hand side, you see Everbody and VO and Of Me and Beverly Hills Rejuvenation Clinic, Alchemy 43, Birch Med Spa Group. Those are all practices that are saying, we want to grow de novo. We want to create new med spa practices and grow our brand. 
Um, Birch cre uh, purchased the Elaze brand based out of Salt Lake City, and they are now growing more Elaze practices. On the right-hand side, you see a lot of the MSOs, the managed service organizations, that are looking at creating management um, situations for practices, and they are funded by many of the private equity groups, such as Shore Capital, as um, Empower Aesthetics is funded by Shore, CPP is funded by a group out of Canada, um, the same group that also owns Arthur Swift's group. Uh, Med Spa Partners is another group up out of Canada. Aesthetic Partners is a group down in the Southeast and funded with um, a couple of uh, Harvard MBAs that have come into this space. Alpha Aesthetics and AMP Aesthetics are both large um, aesthetic practice owner or manager groups that have funding, Leon Capital and Thurston Group, and are buying up practices across the country. So we've really got two things now that are happening um, as we kind of look at more money now coming into aesthetics. And a lot of these groups are, you know, I think what we saw a little bit with us, the, the dermatology influx is they bought a lot of practices and then tried to have economies of scale. And in some places, some dermatologists retired or they may have reduced some of the non-therapeutic indications to meet the private equity goals. Um, within the aesthetic market, we're seeing a little bit of the opposite that these groups are coming in and they're saying, we wanna grow, we wanna have more, we wanna make um, a broader footprint. And in order to do that, they need more providers. And what they're looking at is hiring as many of the NP and PA providers as they can, because we have more and more states that are legislating good faith exams. And when you look at these history and physicals that are required, um, you know, in many cases, the original injectors um, were RNs. You think about when aesthetics really kind of kicked off, it was back in the late 90s. And you had a lot of plastic surgery nurses that were simply told, hey, there's this collagen thing that people want. I'm not a, um, I don't do needles. I'm a surgeon. I cut. You're a nurse. You do needles. You go do the needles. And so a lot of the early injectors for aesthetic medicine with collagen and then with the early days of Botox cosmetic were just nurses in plastic surgery offices. And what we've seen as the specialty has grown and evolved is that now we have 26 states where nurse practitioners have independent practice authority and don't need to have a physician medical director to run their practice. And we're also seeing that in places where the RN injectors were doing the care, there now is really an increased awareness that an NP, a PA, or a physician does need to do that history and physical to diagnose the need for an injectable product and to um, basically prescribe it, especially for any of the toxins that are drugs. So what we're seeing is a high demand in aesthetic medicine for NPs and PAs to provide these additional medical services. So what we are looking at then is a huge need, a huge growth in aesthetic consumer demand, a huge demand from these private equity groups that are coming in or the med spa groups that are expanding. And what do we have? We don't have an academic training avenue for people to go into aesthetic medicine. And it's much like what many of you experienced trying to get into being a dermatology NP or PA. You had this idea, you had this interest, you did a lot of study and research on your own, but getting somebody to hire you as that, you know, with that first job is kind of like, come on, you know? And so it's the same thing in aesthetics. You know, if you look up academic training programs for aesthetic, you know, especially injectables, there's nothing there. And so what we found is that many of the injectors that are out there are people probably like Joe yourself, Joe, and jump in anytime you want, but they've had to create their own residency programs. They've done a lot of self-directed learning. And you probably did, Joe. It's probably a good yeah. time for you to talk about how you got into aesthetic medicine. No, a hundred percent. There's no formal training program that can get you what you need to get up to speed, um, to be competent, safe, comfortable, um, and be able to really take great care of patients. And so you're kind of like thrown to the wolves and you're, on, you're out on, there on your own. And I will just tell everyone that's on this call, there's no weekend program that can prepare you to 
um, in a weekend to inject Botox or any of the toxins or any of the fillers adequately. It just does not exist. Um, you've got to spend a lot of time with patients. You've got to um, learn from people that have experience. And then you've got to treat people and follow up with them and see. And it probably takes, you know, months to years, like six months to a year, year and a half till you're up to speed. It's just like, um, you know, medical dermatology. It takes a long time to really do it and do it well. And uh, unless you are really proficient, you're never going to be successful. It's really not worth doing because as Mary Beth will explain, um, in your average daily uh, work as a nurse practitioner, PA, or if you're an NP or PA at one of the uh, med spas and you're doing all the good faith exams, unless you're treating lots of patients, the revenue that you're going to bring in is probably not worth doing it. So mm -hmm. um, getting hands-on experience, understanding the medical anatomy, understanding the difference between all of the different fillers and all of the different toxins and how to reconstitute them appropriately so you can use them and maximize their benefit and you know really become an expert, um, it's going to be tough. So the um, residency program that uh, and the training opportunities that can that are available are limited. So it's one of the reasons we like Mary Beth so well is that she really is invested in getting us the training we need so that we can be set up for success. Thank you, Joe. It's always good to have someone who's lived it be able to credential what you're saying. So I appreciate it. And well, you, you know, know <laughs> the crazy thing is, um, Mary Beth knows, but and I know no, no one will believe it, but I've actually been injecting uh, botulinum toxin since before it was approved by the FDA, before Botox was Botox, we were using it um, before it got its approval. And when I started injecting with fillers, we did not have hyaluronic acid based fillers. All we had were bovine um, derived collagens. And so I've lived through the full evolution of all of these and have used essentially everything that's come around. And so I do appreciate it at a different level, I think, that a lot of people do. Absolutely. Well, and that's, Joe, you bring up such a good point and something that I talk a lot about to people who are looking to transition into doing more aesthetic medicine now is you don't only have to know how to inject the products that are on the market but you need to understand the evolution of this specialty because patients may have products in their face that have been taken off the market. And you need to know enough about what came before the current products to understand what questions to ask the patients, what to look for in terms of how they present during their facial assessment and how to look at treating that patient. I mean, I think about how some of the um, non-HA filler products were used back in the, I'm going to age myself here, but the, the early 2000s. And it's amazing to think about how far we have come with some of the filler products. Here, I'll yeah. throw this out here for everybody and you can jump into the chat and put your guess in. How many FDA approved or FDA cleared hyaluronic acid filler products are now available on the market in the United States? How many do you guys think? Poor Stacy now is we're going to have the chat room just jump. So <laughs> um, <laughs> um, because it's probably a lot more than most of you think. And um, I don't know if it's jumping in. I'll tell you there are 28 different hyaluronic filler products on the market, hyaluronic acid filler products on the market right now. And, you know, when Joe and a lot of my um, peers, I'm not an injector. I don't play one on TV. I am a salesperson through and through. Um, I, I started with Metasys back in 2005 and sold wrestling for a couple of years, then went over to Allergan. Um, but I've been very blessed to know a lot of really amazing injectors for the years. And I will tell you that all of the great ones have learned this by a lot of trial and error and studying and research. And, you know, a, a lot of people have gone before you to be able to learn a lot of this. So appreciate what you have now because it didn't always be like this. It wasn't always like this. Um, and 
sorry, I know I have my, my funny slide that I, I kind of got off on the topic with it. But so when you're thinking about training, that is the thing. So many people feel like you need experience to get a job, but you need the job to get experience. And it kind of becomes a conundrum. And that's one of the ways, one of the reasons why we started kind of what we did with Titan. And Titan stands for Top Injectors Treating and Aesthetics Now. And we really focus on supporting non-physician injectors, RNs, MPs, and PAs all across the United States who work in aesthetic medicine. And we focus primarily on the injectables because that's my background. And that's, I, I very much believe in staying in my lane. We have a lot of people right now who want to try to be all things to all people. And I don't believe we can do that. That's why you guys have specialties in medicine. And that's why I try to stay within my specialty. So for all of you who are existing dermatology nurse practitioners or physician assistants, you have some things if you want to add aesthetics to your practice that might make it a little bit easier for you than the average provider who is not within a dermatology practice. You already have a job. Um, you may and probably already have patient demand in your existing practice. You may have in-clinic mentors that you can work with and that can help you be able to um, answer questions and study and learn and give you resources. And the other thing is, is that the other thing is there, there might be dermatologist procedure resistance. And what I mean to that is there may be opportunities for um, patients to be able to do some more cash medicine or some more things that, that you could offer that maybe they, they, maybe somebody doesn't want to try Accutane, but they're quite willing to look at um, maybe popping up some of the scars with a dermal filler. Okay, so there may be some different opportunities that you may have in an existing dermatology practice. There also may be some things that might be a little challenging when you have a full-time job, you know, really going back and relearning facial anatomy from an injectable standpoint, there's a lot to learn there. Um, there are so many products, you know, when Joe started, when I started in this, you know, there was one filler. I mean, it was Restylane, Juvederm wasn't out yet. You know, you had um, Botox Cosmetic, Disport wasn't out yet. I used to joke, it was the, the wrestling rep, the Botox rep and the Obagi rep and then all the laser people. And you never knew them because once they sold something, they never showed up again. No, I'm joking. So <laughs> with old jokes. But you know, what we're looking at now is there's so many more products and to integrate cash procedures with the existing therapeutic procedures, it may be a learning opportunity, not only for you, but for some people in, within the office as well. And then learning to sell sometimes is challenging. And we, we talk a little bit at Titan about how there is truly a difference between selling and educating because educating is making sure that you have all that information for the patient, but the patient still has to buy or agree to pay for some of these aesthetic products that are cash only. And so it's a different education and selling process and communication process with the patient. So I just kind of want to think through some of the things that, that might be easy for you and some of the things that might be a bit more challenging. And one of the things that seems to constantly be challenging for anybody out there who wants to learn something new is how do you evaluate what training options are available? And if any of you guys have ever Googled Botox training or aesthetic injectable training or aesthetic training, there are four companies that come up right away. Three of the four are owned by non medical providers. Um, and it's pretty interesting to see what they offer, how they sell and what they charge. And so what we look at within Titan is trying to offer a little bit of um, credentialing for and, and evaluating for you. And one of the things that we really try to encourage people to look at is what are the credentials of the person who is going to train you? And I don't just mean, are they a doctor? Are they an MP? Are they a PA? Are they an RN? What is their credentials? What are their credentials in terms of how long have they been doing this? Where have they trained? Are they a trainer for a large national organization? Have they studied and done this specialty for many years? Because the thing that scares me right now is how many people will go to these weekend training courses and then come home and six weeks later, they've decided they're running their own training company. So really ask those questions before you decide to get training to make sure that whoever is going to be leading the training or writing the curriculum really has the background and the expertise to be able to do it safely and do it well. That does lead into curriculum. 
um, you're going to find two different types of trainings that are out there. One is going to be, hey, I'm an injector. Come shadow and follow me for a day and I'll teach you how to inject. There is some value to that, but more often than not, that is not going to be where you want to start in looking at transitioning into adding aesthetic procedures to your practice. You want to look for some place that has repeatable, reproducible curriculum that is really set up to develop a foundational knowledge of the specialty, a foundational knowledge of anatomy, and then a foundational knowledge of what goes into the products you're gonna use and how you're gonna use those products and what's gonna happen if something goes wrong. I'm always shocked the number of people who tell me they go to a training and they come home and they say, all I did was get scared by going to that weekend course and they didn't talk at all. <laughs> Joe, are you raising your hand or are you <laughs> fixing your <laughs> So, yeah. And, and it's, it's amazing the number of people who think they can be a trainer. So please look at the curriculum and what their objectives are in the curriculum. The third thing that is super important is look at the injecting experience of that person. And it doesn't have to necessarily be how many years have they been an injector, but how much injecting do they do every week? I am not a big fan of people who've decided to become injectors and injector trainers, and they don't have active injector practices. You almost have to still, you know, Joe has his active practice. He's out there injecting every week. And that's why he's so good at what he does. Every but, day, every yeah. day, every hour, all the time. <laughs> and you know, what are the products? What are the problems you're going to run into? What are the questions? It's even a factor of what is hot and trending on Instagram. It used to be, we'd say, what is in the, you know, the lay person magazine. It's a big deal. It's a yeah. big deal because the consumers are being marketed to relentlessly. And you've got to know, because when they come in and they say, I want the lip flip, you got to know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. 